Hello everyone, it's Cassidy again, and today we're going to read more of Cinder by Marissa Meyer. Um, and book two is where we last left off. Chapter nine. Successful transmittal of the carriers, said Lee. All reactions appear normal, blood pressure stabilizing. <clears throat> Signs of stage two expected around one tomorrow morning. He clapped his hands and spun in his chair to face Dr. Erland and Fatine. That means we can go home and take naps, right? Dr. Erland sniffed. He traced his fingers along the screen before him, slowly turning the holographic image of the patient. Um, Twenty little green lights flickering along her bloodstream, spreading slowly through her veins. But he had seen that before, dozens of times. It was the rest of her that held his interest now. Have you ever seen anything like her before? Asked Fatine, standing beside him. The sales from her control panel alone will cover the family payoff. Dr. Erlen tried to give her an unimpressed glare, but it was less effective when he had to tilt his head back to look up at her. It was less than effective when he had to tilt his head back to look up at her. Snarling, he scooted away and turned back to the holograph. He tapped on the top of the glowing spine, where two metal vertebrae connected and enlarged the image. What had been a small shadow before now appeared too substantial, too geometric. Um, Patine crossed her arms and bent down. What is that? I'm not sure, said Erland, said Erland, rotating the image for a better view. It looks like a chip, said Lee. On her spine? What good would that do to her? I'm just saying that's what it looks like. Or maybe they messed something up on the vertebrae and had to re-weld it or something. Patine pointed. This is more than just welding, though. You can see the ridges here, like it's plugged into... She hesitated. They both faced Dr. Erland, whose eyes were following a small green dot that had just floated into the holographic viewing range, like a vicious green butterfly, he muttered to himself. Doctor, said Patine, turning his attention back to her. Why would she have a chip plugged into her nervous system? Perhaps, he said, pulling his spectacles from his breast pocket and sliding them onto his nose. Her nervous system experienced traumatic damage. From a hover accident? asked Lee. Spinal injuries used to be quite common before computer-operated navigation took over. Dr. Erland scratched his nail across the screen, pulling the holograph back to show a whole torso. He squinted into the lenses, his, his fingers flittering over the image. What are you looking for? asked Patine. Dr. Erland dropped his hand and glanced in at the immobile girl on the other side of the window. Something's missing. Um, the scar tissue around her wrist, the dull sheen of her synthetic foot, the crease beneath her fingertips. What's missing? asked Lee. Dr. Ann stepped closer to the window and pressed his sweating palm against the counter. A little green firefly. Behind him, Lee and Patine traded glances before spinning back to the holograph. They each began their count. Him silently, her out loud, with Patine paused on number 12 with a gasp. Um, one just disappeared, she said, pointing to an empty socket on the girl's right thigh. A micro, it was right there. I was looking right at it, and now it's gone. As they watched, two more dots flickered and disappeared, like burned out light bulbs. Lee grabbed his port screen off the desk and pounded his fingers against it. Her immune system is going berserk. Dr. Erlen leaned against, leaned onto the, into the microphone. Med, please draw another blood sample, quickly. The girl jolted to attention at the sound of his voice. The teen joined him at the window. We haven't given her the antidote yet. No. So how... Dr. Erland bit down on a thumbnail to tame the rush of giddiness. I need to go get that first blood sample, he said, backing away, almost afraid to take his eyes from the cyborg girl. When all the microbes had disappeared, take her into Lab 4. Lab 4 isn't set up for quarantine, said Lee. Indeed, but she won't be contagious. Dr. Erland snapped his fingers halfway out the door. And perhaps have the med untie her. Untie? Fatine's face contorted with disbelief. Are you sure that's such a good idea? She was violent with the Metroids, remember? Lee folded his arms. She's right. I know I wouldn't want to be on the other side of that fist if she got angry. In that case, you have nothing to fear, said Dr. Erland. I'll be meeting with her in private. Chapter 10 Cinder started when a mystery voice filled the room again, demanding another blood sample from the sacrificial lamp. She glared at the mirror, ignoring the Metroid as it prepared a new needle with robot efficiency. She called down a gulp, moistening her throat. How long before I get the pretend antidote? She waited, but there was no answer. 
<laughs> the android clipped its metal claws around her arm. She flinched at the cold, then again as a ne needle poked into her sore elbow. The bruise would last for days. Then she remembered that, that tomorrow she would be dead or dying. Just like Peony. Her stomach twisted. Maybe Aju was right. Maybe it was for the best. A shudder racked her body. Her metal leg clanked hard against her restraints. Maybe not, though. Maybe the antidote would work. She filled her lungs with the cool, sterile up air of the lab and watched as the holograph on the wall mimicked her. Two green dots lingered by her right foot. The medroid pulled out the needle and used a cotton ball to stop her the wound. The vial filled with her blood was, take was set into a metal box attached to the wall. Cinder thumped her head against the table. I asked you a question. An antidote? Um, are you- you are at least going to try to save my life, right? Med, said a new voice, a female. Cinder snapped her head around to look her, at herself in the mirror again. Disconnect the patient from a monitoring, monitoring machines and escort her into lab room 4D. Cinder dug her fingernails into the tissue paper beneath her. Lab room 4D. Is that where they sit you so they could watch you die? The android snapped shut her head panel and removed the nodes from her chest. The heart rate machine flatlined. Hello, said Cinder. Could you tell me what's going on? No answer. A green light flickered beside the android sensor, and the room opened. And the door opened into a room's white tiled hallway. The medroid wheeled Cinder's exam table out of the lab past the mirror. The corridor was empty and smelled of bleach, and one of the table's wheels squeaked in time with the android's treads. Cinder craned her head, but was unable to meet the medroid sensor. I think I have some oil in my calf if you'd like me to fix that wheel. The android remained silent. Cinder pressed her lips. Numbered white doors slid past them. What's in lab room 4D? Silence. Cinder drummed her fingers, listening to the crinkle of tissue paper in the wheel um, in the wheel that was sure to give her a twitch. She caught the sound of voices somewhere far away, coming down another corridor, and half expected to hear screams coming from behind the closed doors. Then one door opened, and the android pushed her past a black 4D. The room was almost an, ex an exact duplicate of the other, but without the observation mirror. Cinder was wheeled alongside another exam table, upon which sat a familiar pair of boots and gloves. Then, to Cinder's surprise, the shackles released with a simultaneous whistle of air. She jerked her hands and feet out of the open metal rings before the android could realize it had made a mistake and bind her again, but the android showed no reaction as it retreated to the wall without comment. The door clanked shut behind it. Shivering, Cinder sat up and searched the room for hidden cameras, but nothing struck her as obvious. A counter along one wall held the same heart rate machines and radio detectors as the other had. Um, one net screen to her right sat blank. The door. Two exam tables and her. She swung her legs over the side and snatched up her gloves into boots. While lacing up her left boot, she remembered the tools she stashed in her leg before leaving the junkyard, which, which seemed like eons ago. She unlatched the compartment and was re relieved to find it hadn't been raided. With steadying breath, she grabbed the largest, heaviest tool she had, a wrench, before closing the compartment and tying off her boot. With her synthetic limbs covered and a weapon in hand, she felt better. Still tense, but not as vulnerable as before. More confused than ever. Why give her stuff back if they were going to kill her? Why take her to a new lab? She rubbed a cool wrench against the bruise on the eye of her elbow. It almost looked like a spot from the plague. She pressed on it with her thumb, glad to feel the dull pain that proved it wasn't. Again, she scanned the room for a camera, half expecting a small army of medroids to stampede the room, but no one came. The hallway outside betrayed no footsteps. Sliding off the exam table, Cinder went to the door and tested the handle. It was locked. An ID scanner was inserted into the frame, but it stayed red when she flashed her wrist before it, so it must have been coded to select personnel. Um, she went to the cabinets and fiddled with the row of drawers, but none opened. Tapping the wrench against her thigh, she turned on the net screen. It blazed to life, a holographic image jumping out at her. It was her again, her medical diagram sliced in half. She swiped the wrench through the holograph's abdomen. It flickered, then returned to normal. Behind her, the door whooshed open. Cinder spun, tucking the wrench against her side. An old man in a gray newsboard cap stood before her holding a port screen in his left hand and two blood-filled vials in the other. He was shorter than Cinder. A white lab coat hung from his shoulders as it would a model skeleton. 
Lines drawn into his face suggested he had spent many years thinking very hard over very difficult problems. But his eyes were bluer than the sky, and at that moment, they were smiling. He reminded her of a child salivating over a sticky bun. The door shut behind him. Hello, Miss Lynn. Her fingers tightened on the wrench, the strange accent, the disembodied voice. I am Dr. Erlen, the lead leading scientist of the Royal Lettermosis Research Team. She forced her shoulders to relax. Shouldn't you be wearing a face mask? Um, his gray eyebrows lifted. Whatever for? Are you sick? Cinder clenched her teeth and pressed the wrench into her thigh. Why don't you sit down? I have some important things to discuss with you. Oh, now you want to talk, she said, inching toward him. I was under the impression you didn't care too much about the opinions of your guinea pigs. You are a bit different than our usual volunteers. <clears throat> Cinder eyed him with the metal tool warming in her palm. Maybe that's because I didn't volunteer. In a fluid motion, she raised her arm, targeted his temple, envisioned him crumbling to the floor. But she froze, her vision blurring. Her heart rate slowed, the spike of adrenaline gone before her retina display could warn her about it. Thoughts came to her, sharp and clear amid the syrupy confusion of her brain. He was a simple old man, a frail, helpless old man with the sweetest, most innocent blue eyes she'd ever seen. She did not want to hurt him. Her eye, her arm trembled. The little orange light clicked on and she dropped the wrench in surprise. He clattered to the tile floor, but she was too dazed to worry about it. He hadn't said anything. How could he be lying? The doctor didn't even flinch. His eyes beamed, pleased with Cinder's reaction. Please, he said, painting his finger toward the exam table. Won't you sit? Chapter 11 Cinder blinked rapidly, trying to dispel the fog from her brain. The orange light in the corner of the, her vision disappeared. She still had no idea what had caused it. Maybe the earlier shock to her, Cinder, to her system had messed with her programming. The doctor brushed past her and gestured at the holographic image that jutted from the net screen. You know that recognize this, he said, sliding his finger along the screen so it spun in a lazy circle. Let me tell you what is peculiar about it. Cinder tugged her glove up, pulling the hem of her scar tissue, pulling the hem over her scar tissue. She scooted toward him. Her foot bumped the wrench, sending it beneath the exam table. I'd say about 63.28% of it is pretty peculiar. What do when Dr. Erland did not face her, she bent and picked the wrench up. It seemed heavier than before. In fact, everything felt heavy. Her hand, her leg, her head. The doctor pointed to the holograph's right elbow. This is where we injected the lenomosis carrying microbes. They were tagged so that we could monitor the progress through your, through your body. He withdrew the finger, tapping his lip. Now do you see what is peculiar? The fact that I'm not dead and you don't seem concerned about being in the same room with me? Yes, in a way. He faced her, rubbing his head through the wool hat. As you can see, the microbes are gone. Cinder scratched an itch on her shoulder with the wrench. What do you mean? I mean they're gone. Disappeared. Poof. He exploded his hands like fireworks. So, I don't have the plate? That's correct, Miss Lynn. You do, you do not have the plate. And I'm not going to die. Correct. And I'm not contagious? Yes, yes, yes. Lovely feeling, isn't it? She leaned against the wall. Relief filled her, but it was followed by suspicion. They had given her the plague, but now she was healed? Without any antidote? It felt like a trap, but the orange light was nowhere to be seen. He was telling her the truth, no matter how unbelievable it seemed. Has this happened before? An impish grin spread across the doctor's weathered face. You are the first. I have some theories about how it could be possible, but I'll need to run some tests, of course. He abandoned the holograph and went to the counter, lying out the two vials. These are your blood samples, one taken before the injection and one after. I am very excited to see what secrets they contain. She slid her eyes to the door, then back to the doctor. Are you saying that you think I'm immune? Yes, that is precisely what it seems. Very special. He gripped his hands together. It is possible you were born with it, something in your DNA, or perhaps you were introduced to lettermosis in a very small amount sometime in your past, um, and your body was able to fight it off, therefore building an immunity to it which you utilize today. Cinder shrank back, uncomfortable under his eager stare. Do you recall anything from your childhood that could be connected with this? He continued. Um, any horrible sicknesses in your brushes with death? No. Well, she hesitated, stuffing the wrench into a side cargo pocket. I guess, maybe. 
My stepfather died of lipidosis five years ago. Your stepfather. Do you know where he could have contracted it? Um, I don't know. My guardian, AG, always suspected he got it from Europe when he adopted me. Um, you're from Europe? Your features suggest a Commonwealth ancestry. She shrugged. It felt odd to think she was from a place she had no memory of. Yeah, well, people can live anywhere now, can't they? At least when a plague isn't threatening to shut down the borders. True enough. Were there many sick people in Europe that you recall? Any notable outbreaks? I don't know. I don't actually remember anything from before the surgery. Cyberconagra operation? No, the face transplant. Um, his eyes widened as he took in this new information. You had a face transplant? Sure. Remember a few years back when everyone was getting them? I was hoping they'd add dimples, but she heaved a disappointed sigh. Um, the doctor's smile faltered. I see. Well, before the face transplant, then. I'm joking, Cinder interrupted. Obviously, I was talking about the cyberkinetic operation. Dr. Erlen frowned, making it clear that he did not appreciate her making light of this conversation. Regarding his composure, he continued. Regaining his composure, he continued. What do you mean when you say you don't remember anything? Cinder blew a wisp of hair from her, from her face. Just that. Something about when they installed the brain interface, it did some damage to my, you know, whatever. The part of the brain that remembers things. The hippocampus, I guess. How old were you? Eleven. Um, he really, um, his gaze darted confusedly around the floor as if the reason for her immunity was written on it. Eleven. Because of a hover accident, wasn't it? Right. Hover accidents are nearly impossible these days. Until some idiot removes the collision sensor, trying to make it go faster. Even so, it wouldn't seem that a few bumps and bruises would justify the amount of repairs you had. Cinder tapped her fingers against her hip. Repairs. What a cyborg term. Yeah, well, it killed my parents and threw me, th threw me through the windshield. The force pushed off the hover from the maglev trap. It rolled a couple times and pinned me underneath. Afterwards, some of the bones in my leg were the consistency of sawdust. She paused, fiddling with her gloves. At least that's what they told me. Like I said, I don't remember any of it. Do you have any trouble retaining memories since then, or for forming new ones? Um, not that I know of, she glared. Is this relevant? It's fascinating, Dr. Irwin said, dodging the question. He pulled out his port screen, making some notations. Eleven years old, he muttered. Then again, oh, he muttered again. Then you must have gone through a lot of prosthetic limbs growing into those. Um, she sent her twist to her lips. She should have gone through lots of limbs, but Adrian had refused to pay for new parts for her freak stepdaughter. Instead of responding, she cast her eyes to the door, then at the blood-filled vials. So, am I free to go? Doctor Raymond's eyes flashed as if injured by her question. Go. You must realize how valuable valuable you become to this operation. Her muscles tensed, her fingers trailing along the hard outline of the wrench in her pocket. So I'm still a prisoner, just a valuable one now. Um, his face softened and he tucked the poor out of sight. This is much bigger than you realize. You have no idea how much you're worth. So what now? Are you going to inject me with more lethal diseases? Stars know you are much too precious to kill. You weren't saying that an hour ago. Things are quite different than they were an hour ago. With your help, we could save hundreds of thousands of lives. If you are what I think you are, we could, well, we could stop the cyborg draft to start with. He settled his fist against his mouth. Plus, we would pay you, of course. Hooking her thumbs into her belt loops of her pants, Cinder leaned against the counter that held all the machines that seemed so threatening before. She was immune. Important. The money was tempting, of course. If she could prove her self-sufficiency, she might be able to enroll, enroll Adri's legal guardianship over her. She could buy back her freedom. But even that inside dulled when she let it pee me. Do you really think I can help? I do. In fact, I think every person on Earth could soon find themselves immensely grateful to you. Um, she gulped and lifted herself onto an exam table, holding both legs beneath her. All right, just so long as we're clear, I am here on a volunteer on a volunteer basis now, which means I can leave at any point I want to. No questions or no arguments. The doctor's face brightened, his eyes shining like lanterns between the wrinkles. Absolutely. 
and I do expect payment, like you said, but I need a separate account. Something my legal guardian can't access. I don't want her to have any idea I've agreed to this, or any access to the money. To her surprise, he didn't hesitate, of course. She sucked in a steadying breath. And one other thing. Um, my sister was taken to the quarantines yesterday. If you do find an antidote, or anything that holds promise as an antidote, I want her to be the first one to get it. This time, the doctor's gaze faltered. Um, he turned away and paced to the holograph, rubbing his hands down the front of his lab coat. That, I'm afraid I cannot promise. She squeezed his bit, her fists together. Why not? Because the emperor must be the first to receive the antidote. His eye eyelids crinkled with sympathy. But I can promise your sister will be second. Chapter 12 Prince Kai watched through the glass as a mentor inserted an IV into his father's arm. Only five days had passed since the emperor had shown signs of the blue fever, but it felt like a lifetime. Years worth of worry and anguish rolled into so few hours. Dr. Erland, Erland had once told him of a suspicion that bad things always came in threes. First, his android had broken before she could communicate her findings, and now his father was sick with no hope for survival. <clears throat> what would happen next? What could be worse than this? Perhaps the Lunars would declare war. He cringed, wanting to take back the, th the thought the second he had it. Khan Torin, his father's advisor and the only other human allowed to see the Emperor in such a state, clapped a hand on Kai's shoulder. It will be alright, he said without emotion, in that peculiar way, peculiar way he had of reading another person's thoughts. Kai's father moaned and opened swollen eyes. The room was quarantined on the seventh floor of the palace's research wing, but the emperor had been made as comfortable as possible. Numerous screens lined the wall so he might enjoy music and entertainment, so he might be read to. His favorite flowers had been brought in had been brought in drones from had been brought in droves from the gardens, lilies and chrysanthemums filling the otherwise sterile room. The bed was dressed in the finest silks the Commonwealth had to offer, but none of it made much of a difference. It was still a room made to keep the living separate from the dying. A clear window separated Kai from his father, who was squinting up at Kai now. Um, his eyes were empty as glass. Your Majesty, said Torin, how are you feeling? The Emperor's eyes crinkled at their corners. He was not an old man, but the illness had aged him quickly. His complexion was yellow and pallid, and his black and red and black and red splotches stippled his neck. His fingers were lifted from the blankets, the closest thing he could manage to a wave. Is there anything you need? Torn asked. A glass of water, food, an escort 5.3, Kai suggested. Torn cast the prince a disapproving glare, but the emperor wheezed a small chuckle. Kai felt his eyes misting and had to look away, down at fingertips pressed into the windowsill. How much longer? He said, so quiet his father wouldn't hear. Torn shook his head. Days, if that. Kai could feel Torn's gaze on him, understanding but also harsh. You should be grateful for the time you have with him. Most people don't get to see their loved ones when they're taken away. And who wants to see their loved ones like this? Kai looked up. His father was struggling to stay awake, his eyelids twitching. Med, bring him water. The android rolled to the emperor's side and lifted his backrest, guiding a glass of water to his lips and wiping away the dribble with a white cloth. He didn't drink much, but seemed refreshed when he had sunk again into the pillows. Kai, I'm here, said Kai said, his breath falling in the glass. Be strong. Trust. His words broke into a cough. The Metroid held a towel to his mouth, and Kai caught a glimpse of blood against the cotton. He shut his eyes, measuring his breath. When he opened them again, the Metroid was spilling the ivy with clear, with clear liquid, something to ease the pain. Kai and Torn watched as the Emperor sink into a motionless sleep like watching a stranger. Kai loved him, but couldn't quite connect the sick man before him with the vibrant father he had a week ago. Just one week. A shudder ran through him, and Torrin squeezed his shoulder. Kai had forgotten his hand was here. Um, your highness. Kai said nothing, staring at his father's chest as it rose and fell. The fingers on his shoulder tightened briefly, then fell away. You are going to be emperor, your highness. We must begin to prepare you. We already put it off too long. Too long. One week. Kai pretended not to hear him. As his majesty said, you must be strong. You know I will help in any way I can. Torin paused. You're going to be a fine leader. 
No, I'm not. Kai tugged a hand through his hair, pulling him back from his scalp. He was going to be emperor. The words rang hollow. The true emperor was there in that bed. He was an imposter. I'm going to talk to Dr. Erland, he said, stepping back from the glass. The doctor is busy, your highness. You shouldn't keep distracting him. I just want to ask if there have been any developments. I'm sure he will tell you immediately if there are. Kai set his jaw and fixed his gaze on Torm, the man who had been his father's advisor since before Kai was born. Even now, standing in the same room with Torn made him feel like a child. Um, gave him a peculiar urge to be in relief. He wondered if he would ever get over that. Um, I just need to feel like I'm doing something, he said. I can't just stand here watching him die. Torn's eyes dropped. I know, your highness. It's hard for all of us. It's not the same, I wanted to say, but held his tongue. Torrin turned away from him, faced the window, and bowed his head. Long live the Emperor. Kai repeated the words, whispered around the dryness in his throat. Long live the Emperor. They were silent, leaving the visitor's room and walking and walking down the hallways to the elevators. A woman was waiting for them. Kai should have expected it. She was always nearby these days, so she was the last person on earth he wanted to see. Sybil Mirror. Um, Sybil Mirror, um, part of the Lunar Crown, exceptionally beautiful, with waist-length black hair and warm honeyed skin. She wore the uniform, uniform befitting her rank and title, a long white coat with a long, with a long white coat with a high collar and bell-shaped sleeves, embroidered along the hems with runes and hieroglyphs that meant nothing to Kai. Five paces behind her stood her ever-present, ever-silent guard. He was a young man, as handsome as Sybil was beautiful, with blonde hair pulled into a low ponytail and sharp features that Kai had yet to see an expression on. Sybil's lips curved as Kai and Torin approached, but her gray eyes remained cold. Your Imperial Highness, she said with a graceful dip of her head, how fares the noble, the honorable Emperor Rikin? When Kai didn't respond, Torin answered, not well. Thank you for your concern. I am most displeased to hear that. She sounded about as displeased as a cat who just cornered a mouse. My mistress sends her condolences and a wish for her speedy recovery. She fixed her gaze on the prince, and her image seemed to shudder before him like a, like a mirage. Whispers filled his head. Respect and admiration, compassion and concern. Kai towards gaze from her, silencing the voices. It took a moment for his bracing pulse to steady. What do you want? he said. Civil gesture toward the elevators. A word with the man who will soon be emperor, should the fates deem it so. Kai glanced at Torin, but the face that met him was unsympathetic. Tact, diplomacy, always, especially when it came to the cursed of the Moors. Sighing, he half he half turned to the waiting android. Third floor. The sensor flashed. Please proceed to elevator C, your highness. They boarded the elevator, Sybil floating into it like a feather upon a breeze. The guard entered last, staying by the door and facing the three of them as if they were in mortal danger. Um, his icy gaze made Kai uncomfortable, but Sybil seemed to forget the guard was even there. This is a tragic time for his majesty to fall ill, she said. Kai gripped the rail and faced her, pressing his hatred into the polished wood. Would next month have been more convenient for you? The patience didn't falter. I speak, of course of the alliance discussions my mistress has been engaged in with the emperor. We are most eager for an agreement that will suit both Luna and the, and the Commonwealth. Watching her made him feel dizzy, off balance, so he tore his gaze away and watched the numbers above the doors descend. My father has been attempting to secure an alliance with Queen, with Queen Levana since she first took the throne. She has always declined. He has yet to meet her, her sensible demands. Kai locked his teeth. Sybil continued, My hope is that, as Emperor, we'll be better able to see reason, Your Highness. Um, Kai, was, Kai was silent as the elevators passed floor 6, 5, 4. My father is a wise man. At this time, I have no intention of altering his previous decisions. I do hope we will be able to come to an agreement, but I'm afraid your mistress will need to lower her very sensible demands. Sybil's smile had frozen over her face. Well, she said as the doors opened to the third floor, you are young. He dipped his head, pretending she'd given him a compliment, then faced Torin. If you have a minute to spare, perhaps could you walk with me to Dr. Erman's office? You may have questions I've not thought of. 
Of course, your highness. Neither of them acknowledged the messenger or her guard as they left the elevator. But Kai heard her shivered voice behind them. Long live the emperor, before the door shut. He growled. We should have her incarcerated. A lunar ambassador? That's hardly a show of peace. It's better treatment than they would give us. He raked a hand through his hair. Ugh, lunars. Realizing that Torin had stopped following, Kai dropped his hand and turned around. Torin's gaze was heavy, worried. What? I know this is a difficult time for you. Kai felt his hackles rise in self-defense and tried to nudge them back down. This is a difficult time for everyone. Eventually, your highness, we will have to discuss Queen Lavana and what you intend to do about her. It would be wise to have a plan. Kai stepped closer to Torin, ignoring the group of lab technicians that were forced to swarm around them. I have a plan. My plan is to not marry her. Um, diplomacy be damned. There, end of discussion. Torrin's jaw flexed. Don't look at me like that. She would destroy us. Kai lowered his voice. She would turn us into slaves. Um, I know, your highness. His sympathetic eyes diffused Kai's mounting anger. Please believe me when I say I would not ask it of you. Um, just as I never asked it of your father. Kai backed away and slumped against the corridor wall. Scientists bustled past in their white coats. Android treads whirled on the, on the linoleum, but if anyone noticed the prince and his advisor, they didn't show it. All right, I'm listening, he said. What's our plan? Your Highness, this is not the place. No, you have my attention. Please, give me something to think about other than this stupid disease. Torrin took a calculated breath. <coughs> I'm sorry. I don't think we need to rewrite our foreign affairs policy. We'll follow your father's example. For now, we'll hold out on the peace agreement. A, tre a treaty. And if she won't sign it, what if she gets tired of waiting and decides to follow through on her threats? Can you imagine a war right now with the plague and the economy? She would destroy us, and she knows that. If she wanted to start a war, she would have done it by now. Unless she's just biding her time, waiting for us to get so weak we won't have any choice but to surrender. Kai scratched at the back of his neck, watching the bustle of the corridor. Everyone's so busy, so determined in their search for an antidote. If there were an antidote. He sighed. I should have married. If I'd already married, Queen Levana wouldn't even be an issue. She'd have to sign a peace treaty if she wanted peace. At Torrin's silence, he forced himself to look back at the advisor, surprised to find a, a rare warmth in his face. Perhaps we'll meet a girl at the festival, said Torrin. Have a whirlwind romance, a happily ever after, and no more worries for the rest of your days. Kai tried to glare at him but couldn't maintain it. Torrin so rarely joked, joked. Brilliant idea, why didn't I think of it? He turned, bracing his shoulder against the wall, then folded his arms over his chest. Actually, maybe there's one option that you and my father haven't considered yet. Something that's been on my mind lately. Do tell your, your highness. He lowered his voice. Lately, I've been doing a little research. He paused before proceeding. On the lunar air. Thorne's eyes widened. Your Highness, just hear me out, Kai said, raising his hands to silence Thorne before he could be chastised. He already knew what Thorne would say. Princess Selene, Queen Lavana's niece, was dead. She had died in a fire 13 years ago. There was no lunar air. There are, there are rumors every day, Kai continued. Sightings, people claiming they helped her, theories. Yes, we've all heard the theories. You know as well as I do there's no substance to them. But what if they are true? Kai crossed his arms and ducked his head toward Torin, voice trailing to a whisper. What if there is a girl out there that could usurp Lavana, someone even stronger? Are you listening to yourself? Someone stronger than Lavana? You mean someone like your sister, who had her favorite seems to just be chopped off so she would have nothing better to do than sit and make her fine dresses? We're not talking about Queen Charnery. No, we're talking about her daughter. Kai, the entire bloodline, every last one of them, has been greedy, violent, corrupted by their own power. It's in their blood. Believe me when I say that Prince Selene, even if she were alive, would be no better. Kai realized his arms were aching from squeezing them so hard, his skin gone tight around his fingertips. She can't very well be worse, he said, and who knows, if the rumors are right and she has been on Earth all this time, maybe she would be different. Maybe she would be sympathetic to us. You're... Bashing this wistful, you're basing this wishful thinking on rumors. They never found a body. 
torn Percy's lips in a thin line. They found what was left of one. It couldn't hurt to do some research, could it? Said Kai, beginning to feel desperate. His heart had been so set on the idea for so long. His research harbored so close to his heart. He couldn't bear to think that it, that it had all been just wishful thinking, though the possibility had always lingered in the back of his mind. Yes, it could hurt, said Torin. If Lovana were to find out you were considering this, it would destroy our chance at procuring a, procu procuring a treaty. We shouldn't even be talking about this here. It's dangerous. Um, now he's listening to rumors. Your Highness, this is the end of this discussion. Your objective right now must be to prevent a war, not worrying about phantom lunar princesses. What if I can't prevent it? Torin opened his palms, looking weary after the argument. Argument. Then, you, then the Union will fight. Right. Excellent plan. I'm so comforted now that we've had this talk. He turned away and marched blindly toward the labs. Sure, the Earth and Union will fight. But against Luna, they would lose. <laughs>